What I wanted to do is kind of set the scene because my, the title of my, question, uh, of my paper is Manchester Mass Media Hub Question Mark. And the question mark is very deliberate. And that's one of the questions that I will be addressing during the paper. And what sets the scene in terms of that particular question is if you look at the Media City UK website, you will find that right on the home page it states that our vision for Media City UK is to become a leading international hub for the creative and digital sectors. However, 50 years ago, in what is undoubtedly a seminal work on mass media, Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media, McLuhan saw the electrical communication media, the electrical mass media, as being something very different. A hub implies more centralisation than McLuhan thought was true of what radio and television were going to bring to us. And indeed, what he goes on to say is that it's a principal aspect of the electric age. This establishes a global network that has much of the character of our central nervous system. So I've used an image not of the central nervous system itself, but of a computer, a new computer chip um, architecture that's been developed at the University of Manchester called Spinnaker that is based around the neural networks of the brain. So that's the kind of question that I want to look at is whether the mass media networks really kind of conform to the idea of hubs. So the synopsis is what I'm going to go through is because of the issues that John's already brought out about a certain absence in the record in kind of terms of traditional industrial archaeology. I wanted to take a look at what industrial archaeologists have said before to give it some context, but then look at three questions. Is the term hub appropriate to the mass media industries? And if so, does Manchester already qualify as a mass media hub? Secondly, what has made Manchester a magnet for the mass media industries? And thirdly, how does the physical heritage of the mass media industries contribute to our understanding of them? And I'll be looking at those things in terms of newspapers, radio, television, and online, I'm only going to refer to right at the end because I don't want to steal Nigel's thunder. Um, and in terms of each of those also, there are three elements that we can look at, production, consumption, and distribution. And obviously, it's the distribution part where the network side of things really comes in. So as I say, I'm going to start off with some rather word-heavy slides that give some quotes. So Industrial archaeology is a why. I'm going back again to Marshall McLuhan because he was <laughs> such a, an influential um, communications theorist. Marshall McLuhan is very well known for coining the term the medium is the message in his book, Understanding Media. But mostly this gets used without people really understanding what McLuhan meant. And what McLuhan was getting at was that the medium itself has a real, you know, it shapes the message in a very strong way and that we ignore that as our peril because we fail to understand um, what the media is really all about. And he felt that too often people got seduced by the content um, rather than by the medium. So, I mean, th what this says to us is that if the medium is that important in shaping the message, then clearly we ought to be able to learn something from looking at the media in terms of what created it, the printing presses, the radio sets that we listen to radio on, and the television sets. So then going back to industrial archaeologists, um, I started off by having a look at two books that came out in 1972, one by Arthur Raystrick and one by R.A. Buchanan. And what was rather disappointing, not surprising I have to say, because I kind of pretty much knew this was the case, was that they didn't have very much to say about the mass media at all. Buchanan had absolutely nothing to say about any branch of the mass media, Arthur Raystrick, as far as newspapers went, confined himself to some comments about the impact of growing demand in the 19th century for newsprint on the forestry industry, and then subsequently also in reference to the paper industry, which is why I've used a slide of Trinity Paper Mills in Bolton. Where we get someone who gives it much more attention is that Kenneth Hudson was someone who, in his book, The Archaeology of the Consumer Society, which came out about 10 years later, what Hudson specifically wanted to focus on was the fact that he felt that industrial archaeologists had focused, well, not, not quite exclusively, but they had focused largely on the industries of the first industrial revolution and, indeed, of the pre-industrial period and hadn't paid appropriate attention to the 20th century and the technologies of what he would call the second industrial revolution. So although the chapter in his book that's about the mass media is primarily about radio and television, 
he does allude to newspapers, and in particular to the fact that it's not just about the newspaper technology itself, in the way that we might think of the, the printing and the typesetting technology, but it's also the fact that in gathering the news um, and in also in disseminating news, there's reliance on other kinds of technology, such as recording machines, telex, and, um, and obviously the transport network. And then my just final word, heavy slide, is about radio and television. And this is where Raystrick had nothing to say. Buchanan had quite a lot to say, um, but none of it really added up to anything. Um, <laughs> he, went, he said that, oh, television and radio sets have already become industrial curiosities, and it's to be hoped that someone will consider it worthwhile to pre preserve a representative section before it's too late. Well, I come from a museum that's only existed for three years when he wrote that book. So we didn't have a great collection by then. I can't imagine the Science Museum already had a good collection. Uh, since then, we have got a good collection. Um, but then he goes on to say, a concern for recording and preservation of such architects is the very proper businesses of industrial archaeologists. But really, you know, didn't seem to think anything was happening. And finally, um, going back to Kenneth Hudson, he alludes to the fact that it isn't just all about, if you like, the kind of, kind of the ownership of the network, the people who are sending the messages. It's not just about the BBC. As he says, it's about the hundreds of firms who make valves, cabinets, and components for the radio industry are just as much a part of the industry as the BBC itself, and their premises equally constitute its archaeology. So this is the kind of background against which I wanted to look at the, the mass media in Manchester. So as I said, I'm going to start with newspapers. So once upon a time, there was uh, a man called Joseph Harrop, who in 1752 decided to launch Manchester's first newspaper, the Manchester Mercury. And I've used um, an image from not the first edition of the Mercury, because the first edition had a very plain masthead, but a later edition in 1752, where he's adopted this rather charming kind of medieval printer's workshop as the, um, as the symbol. And, and what you can see is obviously what printers like Harrop were using at that time was a common press. Sadly, Mosey does not have a genuine common press because they are few and far between. And as I say, we're a very young museum. The only rather wonderful um, original common press in Manchester is at Cheatham's Library. Um, and they, this one didn't have a newspaper provenance. It came from a kind of classic Manchester jobbing printers who did kind of you know, leaflets for business and that kind of thing. And they got it in about 1900 and have recently restored it. But that's a real example of the kind of press that Harrop would have been using. And the other key point to, to, to look at in terms of this is that this was nothing, this was not Manchester being at the forefront. And it was Manchester following the wake of newspaper developments elsewhere. And why was that? Well, the picture which was drawn in 1795, gives a bit of a clue. That's called a view of Manchester. Can anybody spot Manchester? <laughs> and obviously, Manchester is not that big. Um, this is a view of the surrounding countryside. With, you can see some chimneys lurking in the, in the background. And this is because at this time, what Daniel Defoe had said 26 years earlier on his uh, tour around, uh, around Britain, was he described Manchester as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, mere village in England. And the reason why I called it a village was it was still governed by a medieval court leaks, which had no MPs, no corporation. Um, but then he goes on to say, yes, it has a collegiate church, several parishes, and mentions Salford, <laughs> as we're here, Salford over the bridge, and is said to contain above 50,000 people, which given the numbers that came up in the first census in 1801, it's probably not far off the case. But essentially, Manchester was nothing remarkable then. There was no sense of what was to come over the next 50 years. The huge change in the cotton industry that turned Manchester into Cottonopolis, the world capital of the cotton industry. So really, what we've got is a, 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 a pretty prosperous market town based on a cotton industry that at that time was domestically based and, um, and a manual kind of museum's manual equipment, not power driven machinery. So that's the context of the first Manchester newspaper. And I'm going to skip on from there to the early 19th century because while there were a few more newspapers in the 18th century, things start to move on a bit. Oh, sorry, my final point on this one was um, to, to point out early 
One charming thing that, that brings back the smallness of Manchester, the address is at the printing press opposite the clock side of the exchange. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't really need to say anything else. It's not big enough. Yeah, you can find the exchange. But also the fact that it's advertiser. And it's advertising that is incredibly significant in newspapers right up to the abolition of stamp duty. Um, because newspapers are, are, are quite expensive. They need advertising income. And also because the news is very slow to reach places. We're talking about the news coming by stagecoach. Um, so there's not, not a lot of news. So even when we move on to the early 19th century, um, I've, I've just got examples of four papers. During the 19th century, there are quite a large number of Manchester newspaper titles. They stay in business for variable lengths of time uh, for various reasons. But to look at a few here, founded in 1818, we have the Manchester Observer with a rather nice masthead with an eye, the all-seeing eye. Um, and the Manchester Observer's duty, the Manchester Observer was specifically set up as a paper with a liberal viewpoint. And therefore, it was scrutinizing you know, politics and world matters from a, from a liberal viewpoint. Um, unfortunately for the Manchester Observer, it never did tremendously well. And when the Manchester Guardian was founded in 1821, also backed by people who wanted to put across a liberal view of the news, the Observer actually kind of gracefully went out of business um, a few months later and kind of ceding the grounds to the Guardian, which I think got, got better financial backing. The Manchester Guardian, of course, we'll come back to. The Manchester Guardian is the far, you know, the, the, the paper that remains in business today and by far the most successful. And then we move on to the Courier, founded in 1825, a Tory newspaper, and the Manchester Times, founded in 1828, a more radical newspaper. There were plenty of people who felt that the liberalism of the Guardian was no near radical enough. So. The Manchester Times was to cater for their taste. So what we see in the 19th century is newspapers quite specifically being targeted at audiences with particular political viewpoints. So this is not something new today. And that was the way you found your kind of niche audience. And those newspapers, um, mostly in the early days, were being printed on that type of press. This is a press in our collection. It was used in the newspaper industry, but unfortunately not the newspaper industry in Manchester, the newspaper industry in Oxford. Um, because we have never found a surviving one around in Manchester. So that's the Stanhope Press, the first all-metal press, uh, which could basically make more impressions per hour than the common press and printed more clearly, which was really important when you consider that newspapers at this time. Does anybody think they'd like to read a newspaper from that time? No. Not only are there very few pictures, but it's tiny print, it's very de densely printed, and that's because of stamp duty. Basically, newspapers tend to be four pages, they come out once a week, um, and you pack in as much as you can to those four pages because you're paying stamp duty according to the number of pages. Advertising, um, you need, that helps, but you also have to pay a tax on adverts. So that really shapes the way that newspapers are, as much as the fact that obviously literacy levels are low, and therefore, there are a lot of people for whom a newspaper is absolutely no use nor ornament. Um, but this kind of press, the Stanhope Press, so if you haven't got a huge demand, the Stanhope Press was actually pretty much would do the job for you fine. However, as we get into the 1820s, in 1814, the Times in London had adopted the steam press for the first time. This was quite slow to catch on in the provinces, because of the smaller audiences. However, the Courier um, in 1825, when it was founded, and then the Guardian in 1828 did adopt the steam press, which meant that you quadrupled, basically, the number of impressions you could make in an hour. And um, coming back to Archibald Prentice and the Manchester Times, the Manchester Times was not a very long-lived newspaper. It was found um, a bit too preachy for many people's tastes. Archibald Prentice, who was the main journalist on it, was in many ways a very pioneering <laughs> journalist, but he had very strong viewpoints, um, which I think some of his audience sometimes found overwhelming. So in 1847, the Manchester Examiner, which had been founded in 1846, acquired Archibald Prentice's Manchester Times 
and became the Manchester Examiner and Times. And what do we see that the Manchester Examiner and Times has, which becomes characteristic of newspaper print works over the next, basically, century and more, is a fantastic grocery um, newspaper press made by an American company called Ho. This is a Ho press. And what I'm going to come on to in a bit is actually looking at the built legacy of the newspaper industry. And while it's easy to imagine that presses like the Common Press and Stanhope Press wouldn't necessarily leave much mark in terms of needing buildings that are very recognisable, this kind of press, you would assume, would shape a building in a way that would be recognisable, although actually this is really not the case. And what I'm just going to say before I look at the, the kind of a map of the Manchester newspaper industry is that although in the early days of the Manchester newspaper industry, Manchester's kind of industrial might that began from in the 1780s didn't really have much to do with its role in the newspaper industry. Printing presses were made in Manchester, but they weren't presses for the newspaper industry. They were smaller presses used by jobbing printers. But what did happen in the late 19th century was that Manchester became the UK base for the diffusion of what of a technology that revolutionised the newspaper industries, the mechanisation of typesetting. And this is something where, although the printing press had become more efficient, typesetting up until the introduction of line casting machines was still being done by hand. It was very slow and laborious. And after 1855, when the Stamp Act um, is abolished, so basically no more stamp duty, Newspapers become cheaper. 1870, the Education Act starts the increase in literacy. So you start getting more daily newspapers, newspapers being longer. So not only do you need print presses that can print more pages per hour, you also need to speed up typesetting. And this is a process that was invented in the United States by someone called Otto Mergenthaler in about 1884. And a Manchester publisher called Joseph Lawrence, who at that time was a magazine publisher, uh, amongst other things, he published a, a magazine about railways. He went over, saw this technology, and thought, this is brilliant. This is going to change things. I will get the license for manufacturing this technology in Britain, which he did. And initially, the factory of his company, Lions Hyper Machinery, was in Manchester itself, in the centre of Manchester. Subsequently, for most of its life, it was in Broadheath, near Altrincham, which we've already seen a reference to, where obviously you could spread out over more land more cheaply. Um, but what we have is an example of the very first model of linotype made in Manchester, which is called the square-based linotype from about 1892 on the left. On the right, not looking very different, is the linotype machine used in the Daily Mail's Northcliffe House between 1968 and 1987. And as also you can see from these two photographs, we have a photograph of linotype machines in use in about 1901, and then linotype machines in Maxwell House in the mid-1980s. Mid Do they look very different? No. And so one of the things that this actually tells us, which we'll be coming on afterwards, is why there needed to be a technology revolution in the newspaper industry by the mid-1980s. Basically, the technology, yes, it had improved, but it, hadn't, it couldn't improve in any kind of exponential sense. It was just gradual improvements. It was out of date, really, by that time, and as you can see by those photographs. So, oh yes, and this is Linotype's proud boast. Every hour of the working day, a Linotype machine is made and delivered. So moving on to Manchester, and from around about 1900, Manchester really is a newspaper city. And that's because the early Manchester newspapers, as my kind of title set, were pretty much local news for local people, to paraphrase the League of Gentlemen. Um, but by 1900, what was happening was that there was more consciousness of national news. And the national papers, the papers basically based in London, were looking at spreading their influence far more. And as far as Manchester goes, the first of them to make a mark in Manchester is the Daily Mail, which opens offices on Deansgate in 1898. Northcliffe House at the bottom there, the first building that they built on Deansgate um, in 1902, 
I don't, I'm not sure what a lot of the pictures of it do survive, but not a very interesting building. Northcliffe House, uh, designed by Manchester architects Beaumont in 1932. Very nice Art Deco building. I'll come back to that in a minute. The oldest of these buildings is the Guardian, original Guardian, and then and Manchester Evening News offices on Corporation Street at the bottom. That's a building that I think everybody could probably agree could be anything. Could be any kind of offices or any kind of business. You can't really tell what it is. And that was the Guardian and MEN headquarters from 1886 to 1970. 1970, they moved to this rather trite um, building on Deansgate, which was quite noticeable, but now has been lost since 2006 in the Spinning Fields redevelopment. Um, and then we have a survivor, kind of. We have what was Manchester's biggest print works and indeed Europe's biggest print works in the 1930s on Withy Grove, uh, a building that was variously, it was known by various <coughs> titles, quite often just Withy Grove, because it was started up by um, Edward Holton, newspaper group, sold to Allied newspapers. Allied newspapers were split. And from 1937, when well, Allied newspapers were split between two of the Berry brothers, it became Kemsley House. And then it was subsequently known after each of its proprietors, Thompson House and then Maxwell House, right at the end, which obviously used to amuse people. Um, it looks like an advert for coffee rather than a printer works. This wasn't listed, it did survive as just the facade of the Print Works Leisure Centre. So we should be grateful for that. And what I'll come back to on another one as well is the one truly distinctive newspaper print works, um, not just in, in Manchester, because there were similar ones in, on Fleet Street in London and in Glasgow, but the Daily Express's offices. Um, but basically all that survives of the newspaper buildings from this period is the Daily Express building the facade of Withy Grove. And although it's only about 10 years ago that Northcliffe House was demolished, it wasn't, um, it wasn't listed, although it did get one, one architectural historian, um, Claire Hartwell, in the revised PEVS, that described it as spirited. I mean, I think it's a great building, and this is the same architect who did Kendall Mill on, on Deansgate. And if you look at this distribution, what, what's this influenced by? Well, basically what it's influenced by, Victoria Station. Because when it comes to distribution of newspapers, newspapers don't have their own distribution network. Newspapers use the distribution networks provided by transport services. And primarily in the early days, obviously, public transport services. Piccadilly is off over here. And, but, you know, Victoria is particularly important and that's because, I don't expect you to read this, but basically this is from around about the early 1980s, but this is the list of all the departures of newspaper deliveries from Manchester. And the biggest list at the top is the ones from Victoria Station. So that's why being close to Victoria was really important. Next we've got four from Piccadilly. We've got a number going by road, some of which are a bit weird. And then by air, we've got... Um, Ireland, basically both north and south, and the Isle of Man. And so what is remarkable is that what, you know, in the 20th century, what Manchester became was it became the place where the northern editions of most national newspapers and the Irish editions were printed. So it genuinely was a newspaper hub. Admittedly, the wheel was a bit lopsided. Its reach extended further to the west than it did to the east and further to the north than it did to the south. But newspapers printed in Manchester went over a significant distance, which is why you needed a print works like Withy Grove, which was the largest in Europe. So also, what other kind of things can we see evidence of? Manchester has some really interesting newspaper dynasties that I'm going to pick on too. Manchester Guardian, obviously, is the great success story of Manchester newspapers, the only provincial newspaper to become a national paper. I've said 1959, 1959, was when it changed its name from the Manchester Guardian to the Guardian. But that was basically because by then it was already getting a larger national circulation. The other thing that's really unique about the Guardian is that its ownership 
since 1936, lies with the Scott Trust, although that was reformed in 2008 to be a limited company. But what that all comes from is the reason the, that The Guardian became was successful in becoming a national newspaper is its journalistic reputation. And that really starts with C.P. Scott, who um, was a nephew of the person who at that time was the proprietor in the 1870s, um, becomes the editor of the, the Manchester, Manchester Guardian and remains editor until he is 83. And it was almost like, you know, kind of like dying in the saddle because within months of him relinquishing the editorship to his son Ted, his younger son, he, he died. And you can see CP had the same kind of beard, although obviously it got whiter with age throughout his life. And this is again showing his liberal affiliations. He was a liberal MP. This is him with Winston Churchill at the time when Winston Churchill too was a liberal MP and a, a Manchester MP, well, Manchester area MP at that time. And CP Scott really shaped The Guardian as it is today. Although it has to be said that The Guardian's liberalism isn't, hasn't always been as consistent as it could be. But, you know, he was known for the fact that, for example, in the Boer War, The Guardian was one of the few papers that opposed the Boer War. That wasn't necessarily popular in the Liberal Party. However, and we have a tray cloth, which is basically commemorating the Dardanelles campaign in the First World War, and that was The Guardian souvenir. And, that, and actually, there were people in the Liberal Party who regarded C.P. Scott as a turncoat for supporting the First World War. But Lord George, who had also opposed the Boer War, made a personal appeal to C.P. Scott because he thought that if C.P. Scott supported the First World War, it would make a big difference to public opinion. So that's just a, a nice way of representing that kind of a story which you, well, other than through reading the newspapers themselves, you don't find that easy to represent. And the newspaper bag, the kind of piece of ephemera that often museums don't collect, but the fact it's got the New Guardian name is a way of, of celebrating that change. And also the kind of underpinnings of the newspaper industry that people don't always think about. Not the presses, not the typesetting, but getting documents and pictures from one part of a huge building <coughs> to another. For example, using pneumatic communication systems. So we have a pneumatic communication system from, or part of it, from the Guardian building. But then moving on to, well, kind of two in, in one, if you like, other Manchester dynasties. That was the kind of broadsheet end, or was broadsheet, now Berliner. At the tabloid end, we had the Daily Dispatch, launched in Manchester in 1900 by Allied newspapers. And as you can see on that, it says, the paper that knows and tells. <laughs> Um, and also proudly saying that it reaches half a million readers. And this is really substantial. I mean, this is this way outgunning the, the Guardian. This is kind of national newspaper level. And what this comes from is another really interesting <coughs> Manchester di dynasty, the Holton family. Ned Holton, the first Edward Holton, worked for the Guardian. That's where he learned about the newspaper trade. Set up his own business, started off with quite a niche business. Things like the Sporting Chronicle was one of his early papers. Um, and his son, uh, Edward Holton II, is the one who founds the Daily Dispatch and also the second Manchester Evening newspaper, the Manchester Evening Chronicle. And he also founds another paper called the Daily Sketch in opposition to the Daily Graphic, which was the first really kind of picture-based newspaper. And what's really sad is that by the time we get to Edward Holton III, who founds Picture Post, the Holtons have gone away from Manchester and are based in London. Otherwise, perhaps the fantastic Picture Post Library, the Holton Getty Library, would have ended up being around in Manchester, um, but sadly not. But Edward Holton II sells Withy Grove and his newspaper titles to Allied newspapers in 1924. And this brings in another dynasty, the Welsh Berry Brothers. Um, who owned Allied newspapers at that time. And they split Allied in 1937 with Goma Ber uh, Berry, who was Baron Kemsley, hence Kemsley House, taking Withy Grove and its titles, including the Daily Dispatch, while his brother, who was Baron um, Camford, I think it is, uh, Camgate, become, takes the Daily Telegraph. 
So, as I say, that's the tabloid end catered for too. And it's these kind of personal stories that buildings can't express and a lot of technology can't express, but actually have a lot of bearing on both the kind of medium and the message. So also, um, here's a bit of a pun, expressive in look and indeed. In look, the Express building, this is the only newspaper building that architectural historians show any enthusiasm for. Um, and this was actually originally when the Daily Express moved to Manchester, they, they, they moved into a corset factory on Great Ancote Street on exactly this site. But then, by the, 10 years later, they rebuilt it. And some historians regard this as the best of the three Daily Express buildings, partly because the first one in London, they think Owen Williams, who was primarily a structural engineer, his influence was diluted by the architect that he worked with, whereas this was Owen Williams, pure and simple, the structure expressing itself. Um, and so this is genuinely, this is the kind of building that unfortunately the mass media tends to lack. A recognisable building because it is kind of designed from the inside out. It's designed to accommodate the huge printing presses and then it, it expresses that on the outside in a way that's very modernistic. But um, also it's true to the kind of structure of the building internally. And it's been described by John Parkinson Bailey um, in a History of Manchester Architecture as the ultimate expression of the wallless building, curtain wall building. And um, also, this is the kind of thing that influences other architects. Norman Foster, born in Manchester, trained in Manchester, arguably one of Britain's greatest architects, said of the Daily Express building that his dramatic quality gave him a real architectural charge because he could walk there and back in his lunch hour, so he saw it all the time. This was the kind of building that inspired him. But also, it wasn't just what was on the outside, it was what happened on the inside. The Daily Express um, was very smart at taking kind of gambles on things. And one opportunity that came up in 1966 was that when the Lunar 9 landed on the, on the moon, the George Royal Bank radio telescope was able to pick up signals but because the radio telescope can only pick up sound and it wasn't meaningful as sound, it knew there were pictures. And it thought, ah, oh, what might decode this? A newspaper picture receiver. And the Daily Express was prepared to take along its Muirhead picture receiver to decode the signals, and therefore it got the scoop. It got to publish the photographs, the first photographs taken of the moon from the surface of the moon before the Russians. And that's why this is in our Manchester Science Gallery. Very proudly, they put the label on it to say that's what that machine was used for. And this so pleased Lord Beaverbrook that he said, it is a great joy to me to see the energy and efficiency of Manchester pushing through to the top. <laughs> so, you know, always, everyone likes a scoop. But then what are we left with now? Well, post whopping, which I refer to in terms of the typecasting, ta typesetting technology, no longer a hub. And what I should say is whopping, what people may, may not always remember about whopping is, before whopping came Warrington and Stockport and Eddie Shah, Eddie Shah's messenger group. There were strikes about the introduction of new technology in Warrington and Stockport before the great, huge whopping strike, obviously, where that got the, the profile because of the immensity of the Murdoch Empire. But effectively, you know, once all the... Dust had fallen. I mean, what we were left with was an industry that badly did need to be updated and upgraded. And what that meant, one thing that it meant was it tended to mean a separation of the journalistic function from the printing function. So what we now have in Manchester, we have only two newspaper print works, and they are print works. Journalism happens somewhere else because journalistic content can easily be transmitted to print works. And neither of them in Manchester itself, because we're no longer really bothered about the railway network. We're primarily sending things by road, where you've got you know, far, far more granular network that allows finer distribution. So we have the Guardian Print Centre, which in my photograph, this was originally built in, 18, uh, in 1986 as Trafford Park Printers to print the Daily Telegraph. And it was regarded by some people as a kind of a devilish pact that the Guardian decided to take part ownership of Trafford Park printers and share that facility with a kind of a, a rival newspaper of a completely different political persuasion. However, subsequently, the Daily Telegraph has not been printed there for quite a while, and this is now known as the Guardian Print Centre. There are two Guardian Print Centres, 
one in London, one in Manchester. And also the Trinity Mirror Group has a print works in Hollingwood. But neither of those is as big as the biggest newspaper printing works in the north of Ind England, which is Broughton Printers near Preston. And that's really about the fact that the, the influences on where print works were at the beginning of the 20th century, by the end of the 20th century, the influences have completely changed, you know, being based around road networks, different kind of distribution system. And this would be my point with um, the, the whole kind of hub. Yes, it's true that in terms of newspapers, Manchester was a hub, but truly that the, the, the hub analogy is about the transport networks as it used rather than about the printing industry itself. The hub analogy gets stretched more and more the further away from transport we move. So on to radio and the birth of the BBC. So why Manchester in this case? Well, in this case, it really is about industry. Because Metropolitan Vicars of Trafford Park was one of the six companies that founded the BBC, and this is the BBC when it was the British Broadcasting Company, not corporation as a public body. And why was that? Well, Metropolitan Vicars, up until 1919, had been British Westinghouse. British Westinghouse, i.e. the British branch of the American Westinghouse Corporation. And even after... Metropolitan Vickers became separate and was no longer British Westinghouse. It continued to have a very close relationship with what had been the parent company in America. And basically, the point about Westinghouse in the States was that this kind of chimes in with what John was saying as well about um, kind of American attitudes. In America, they had been longing to overturn Marconi's patents way before the First World War. The First World War gave them a great opportunity because they used the national interest, obviously radio in terms of military communications, as a reason for suspending Marconi's patents, which allowed companies like Westinghouse the freedom to do a lot more experimentation and development of radio technology. So Westinghouse in Pittsburgh has an experimental radio station going by 1916. By 1920, that is broadcasting to the public and is the first commercial, because they're all commercial in the States, radio station in the States. So what Metropolitan Vickers had, Metropolitan Vickers could benefit from learning about the Westinghouse technology that had been developed during that earlier period. And that's why Manchester was at the forefront of the founding of the BBC. So basically, um, the first BBC radio station in Manchester and the way that the BBC opened its stations was, and I'm sure it was a deal whereby London had to go fast, because given that 2LO opened in London on one day in November, and the other two stations, 2ZY in Manchester and 5IT in Birmingham, opened the day afterwards, clearly they could all have opened on the same day, <laughs> had it not been for the need to give the capital precedence. Um, but 2ZY in Manchester, as we can see, a slightly um, ramshackle arrangement. We have the, British, uh, the Metropolitan Vicars site with this lovely water tower, which was a distinguishing feature, conveniently used to hang an aerial on. Unfortunately, of course, not only does nothing like that exist, pretty much the whole of the Metropolitan Vicars site has been raised since GEC moved out. So that doesn't exist anymore. We have lost that kind of material. And inside um, were some very quaint, but again, rather makeshift studios from which they broadcast. But even though it was really on a very um, makeshift level, you know, there were still real broadcasting achievements, including the fact that one of their programmes was a children's programme, Kiddies Corner, which was the first children's radio programme in Europe. So they were experimenting with the kind of content. So at least that looked quite distinctive in its own time. Where did the BBC go from there? Does anybody know this building in Manchester? Anybody recognise it on Piccadilly? Yeah, see, Nat West below? Well, this was the first broadcasting house in Manchester. What happened with the BBC was after they decided that they couldn't stay at Metropolitan Vickers, they had a couple of short-term lets. They moved to the fourth four floor of a cotton warehouse in Dickinson Street. And apparently the problem with that was that the only way you could get to the studio was using a goods lift. 
that had to be manually operated. So for both presenters and visitors, you had to kind of get yourself up to this floor. Then they found larger premises that they needed on Orme buildings on the parsonage. Didn't like those because it overlooked the River Irwell, which at the time was somewhat smelly. And so finally, in 1929, they arranged to lease new and larger premises on Piccadilly above a bank. So it was a bank then on the ground floor. It's a bank today. But this is the thing about leaving marks on the landscape. If you didn't know, would anybody think that was a broadcasting studios? No, right. because it looks like it could be any kind of office building. And this is one of the problems um, that, that we kind of really come across is that, you know, one of my beliefs is that mass media doesn't come across strongly in ind industrial archaeology because it's not recognisable. The impact on the landscape, it could be anything. You don't know that's a mass media impact. And indeed it isn't because the building existed, they just make use of it. So that was the former. And much more distinctive, for example, is something like what was used in site, the classic BBC River microphones, 1940s, made by Marconi. But another little quote, and so what Kenneth Hudson's comment about this building was, as a piece of broadcasting archaeology, it has to be interpreted with a great deal of imagination, fed by the reminiscences of those who worked in it. And that, as John has also alluded to, is another point that I'll come back to, is that because some of the stuff in the, in the mass media is not visually distinctive, it's the people that bring it to life. It's the people that make you understand what was special about it. So what was happening at the consumer ends? Well, I'm just going to quickly romp through these ones. I've specifically picked um, an unusual looking crystal set because this is a gold tone, the brand name used by Warden Goldstone of Salford, so a local radio manufacturer. A more common kind of crystal set was this one, made by GEC. And of course, one of the things about crystal sets was this was not easy listening in any sense. It was very difficult to tune in to the crystal with your cat's whisker. But also, it wasn't communal listening, because all a crystal set could do, it could only have enough power to deliver sound waves to a, to a pair of headset. So it was a very solitary experience listening to the radio in the days of the crystal sets. And um, you won't be able to see this, but I like our little set of crystals here, because they are British electrical instruments uh, whose address was Wireless House on Hanging Ditch in Manchester. And I've never seen, I don't know what Wireless House became, but obviously a very appropriate name. And it was only really when we got into the 1930s, when we got over the hurdle of the first valve sets, which were also horrendous because they were battery operated, and it wasn't just a dry cell battery, it was a wet battery, a very heavy battery, that you had to take to the shop to have recharged periodically. So there's no fun in that. So, you know, what people really wanted for an easy listening experience where the wireless rather than maybe the fire starts to become the focal point of the living room is the proper mains operated radio set, the classic one of the 1930s. And we are very fortunate in having the collection of Ferranti, um, the company based in, well, Oldham and Manchester um, for more or less 100 years, and it was their factory. Although they started their radio production in Oldham, in the 1930s, light engineering had become a big enough part of their business that they got another factory in Moston. And this is where they make radio sets like the wonderful Lancastria, um, and these wonderful kind of Art Deco adverts. And here you can see the women, and note also that this kind of imagery shows it's women workers doing light engineering. And then we have George and Beryl Formby being impressed by the latest Franti radios. That's John Formby doubtless played much on those kind of radios. So from broadcasting house to new broadcasting house, what an eyesore. <laughs> um, and I deliberately used a photograph of broadcast of new broadcasting house now that it no longer has the kind of characteristic BBC sign over the door, because at least that meant that you knew what it was. Now that it doesn't have um, the sign, you really can't tell what it is at all. So that's inside. Obviously, once you get inside, you can tell. And you have great pieces of documentation that also bring the whole thing to life. And we took the opportunity of the removal of the analog uh, equipment in 2004 to collect some of that, which we have on display. But one of the other nice stories about New Broadcasting House was that the only Radio 1 show regularly broadcast from outside London was the Mark and Larch show 
And on its very last airing in Manchester, we got them to sign the last running order, and we have this. And a great classic large quote circled there is, at last, I'm a museum piece. <laughs> So finally, I'm going to try and romp through my bit on television. So starting off with the fact that initially, Manchester is television on the fringe. Television is only happening in the London area up until after the Second World War. But Baird is very keen to promote his system. So he arranges demonstrations all over the country. So we have, in 1930 in Manchester, a demonstration organised at Frank's and attended by the actor Jack Buchanan, who was very popular then. And with the Baird Televisor, the great thing is you only have to look at a Baird Televisor to know that it was never going to catch on. <laughs> you just have to look at the size of the screen, know that it was 30 lines. You know, it's fine having a small screen like your mobile phone if you've got really good resolution. 30 lines on that, no. And hence the fact that obviously EMI's electronic scanning system won out and by 1939 was producing this kind of television which was fine if you live within 10 miles or so of Alexandra Palace, the only transmitter, because we had to wait until 1951 to have television in the Northwest. And that's you, when... You could get from Sutton Coalfield, we did. Right. Just about. Sutton Coalfield's just before. Well, Sutton Coalfield. So basically, the, the steps in the extension of the network are London to Birmingham, Sutton Coalfield, and then Birmingham to Manchester. So by 1951, television has reached Hull Moss, um, the Manche well, I say Manchester, it's near Huddersfield, but the aerial serving the Manchester area. And very proudly in the, um, the brochure of the day saying it's serving 11 million people and is the world's largest vision transmitter. Not the, large, the world's most powerful sound transmitter, but the most powerful vision transmitter. But other than that, in terms of television production, it's all a bit makeshift again. And this is again goes to the fact of lack of recognisable buildings. Basically, studios... Churches, theatres, cinemas can be used as studios and are used because it's cheaper in the early days before people really know it's going to take off. So the BBC used a Methodist church that had been converted to a film studios by Mancunian Films. They stopped working and then it became the BBC and that was their early studios and that's where Top of the Pops was brought for us from. These are the kind of um, televisions that's been in Manchester, uh, made in Manchester. But the really si significant kind of first was the fact that to get the television signals to, to Scotland, that it needed to use a microwave system, primarily so that there were fewer relay stations needed between, because uh, microwaves can be transmitted over long distances. And Manchester was one end of it. So it went from Telephone House in Manchester to Windy Hill to um, Kirkershots and then to Edinburgh. And what we have is we have, this is two or four cabinets from the... Uh, Windy Hill End and the microwave dish from Kirker Shots, which is part of the BT Connected Earth system. And this was the world's first um, commercial microwave link on that particular frequency. And then we have independent television, which has really characterised Manchester more in many ways because they did bother building, well, at least in the case of Granada, they did bother building their own studios. They wanted to make a statement. So over 10 years, they built what was the first purpose-built television studios outside London and the first purpose-built independent television studios in the UK. So that's the Coronation Street set from around about that time. And Granada, until it merged with Carlton to become the single ITV company, was the longest-running franchise holder. It's also got Coronation Street, the longest-running British television set, serial, and great successes such as you know, the massively... Um, award-winning Bright said revisited. So Granada's had an enormous influence on television production, but this whole site, now that Granada's moving out, is vulnerable. It is not listed. I believe parts of it should be listed um, because it is very significant. But it wasn't alone until 1968. It shared broadcasting with ABC, which was the weekend channel. ABC, um, therefore, had a rather different view. Um, they bothered building new offices in the centre of Manchester, and they're still there. That's Mount Street next to the Friends Meeting House. Quite rather nice, 1960s building. Um, but they used something, a cinema in Didsbury called the Capital, as their studios. Unfortunately, that's completely gone. That was a lovely 1930s Art Deco cinema. After ABC moved out, Manchester Polytechnic, as it was then, used it. 
But then when they moved out in the late 90s, it became redundant and sadly being demolished. So that's another piece of forecasting history lost. Um, and we've recovered a bit more of the analog era because when the tele as well as when the television studios went analog at much the same time as the radio, to, uh, went away from analog, shall I say, at the same time as the radio ones. So we took some of the analog television equipment as well. And uh, what this also kind of points to is obsolescence in the industry. Now, obsolescence in production, which is something that Buchanan referred to, isn't nearly so great as with consumption. But I think this is, as John alluded to as well, another of the reasons why industrial archaeology hasn't really focused very well um, on this whole area. And as an example of that, and this is a bit of a cheat, because the Cyberman from Doctor Who has nothing to do with Manchester, um, but just to indicate, and I am not focusing on his groin for any fetishistic reason, but if you can notice, the reason why that stands out is that this is a costume that was repaired with gaffer tape. Silver costume, it got torn, they put gaffer tape on it and sprayed it. High definition, cannot do that kind of thing, cannot get away with it. So something like that actually tells you something interesting about the technology of the day. And just again, um, getting, I am getting to the end now. Um, in front of the camera, this is the kind of area where a lot of physical remains don't really tell you about the people who are so important in this medium. Tony Wilson, one of Manchester's broadcasting legends, happened to have been a Mosey trustee. Um, so at the moment, we have on loan his personal collection from his son, um, including like his friend photograph, a uh, video camera he used at Granada. And he was somebody who lastly worked for the BBC as well, so he did have a foot in the, um, the public and the independent camps. And equally, when we come on to some of the other creative areas, we've already had really successful creative clusters in the Manchester area. Stop motion animation, Cosgrove Hall, very much the kind of core of that. And um, people who have worked with Cosgrove Hall, like Bridget Appleby, have gone on to be individually successful. Um, she's won, as well as all of their awards, she's individually won a BAFTA for um, The Reluctant Dragon. And that's one of the first puppets she made for Rainbow. Um, and Paul Berry, whose collection we have, that's a weasel head from Wind in the Willows, which people may remember fondly as one of Cosgrove's Hall's wonderful productions. But then also, because puppets need to be made for these productions, we have McKinnon and Saunders in Altrincham, who not only make puppets for Cosgrove Hall and also people like Hot Animations who do Bob the Builder, but also, as you can see there, make the puppets for the fantastic Mr Fox. So they're serving not just the mass media, but also um, the cinema. And then independent drama. Red Productions in Manchester, uh, very high profile company, won a lot of awards. Nicholas Schindler's The Lynchpin, and you will recognise here Russell T. Davis, lastly known as the saviour and reinventor of Doctor Who, but originally known for much more kind of edgy dramas um, like Queer as Folk. Um, and Russell T. Davis, when he was working at Granada, said, if only they'd let him work on Coronation Street, which is what he really wanted to do, he would probably never have left. <laughs> but they didn't. However, on the other side, we have Paul Abbott, who did do his real training, working as first a script editor and then a writer on Coronation Street. And of course, Paul Abbott, apart from working with Rep Production on um, various things like Clocking Off, which this award was, has also, was also the person who created Shameless. Shameless originally filmed on a real estate in Gorton, now filmed on a purpose-built set in Wizenshaw. So there's, and what's quite incestuous about these kind of creative clusters is you won't be able to read this, but when you go to the Rep Productions website and look for their address, their address is Granada Television. Now, Granada isn't their only client. They've made for you know, ITV, BBC, and Channel 4, which leads me on to my almost final slide, um, which is, so, in the days of the, the, the current mass major, should Media City be calling itself a hub? I don't think it should. I think, at best, what it is is a super cluster. I think in terms of the mass media, it's not about the media radiating outwards. It's about bringing creativity inwards. So it's more kind of centrifugal than centripetal. Um, and, and this isn't new. I mean, essentially, I think whether Media City had happened or not, it might not have done. Had not, ITV and the BBC got together early in uh, this century to form 360 Media, which is their shared production facility. 
which is currently left at Granada, although they still seem to claim um, that the BBC studio at Oxford Road is available. And while Media City may be the biggest cluster, it's not the only one. The Sharp project, site doesn't look like that anymore, that's when it was Sharp, has 50 creative companies, 75% occupied at the moment, and was where um, programmes like, I think it was Casualty 2010, the, the one that was, sorry, 1910, the one that um, starred Sherry Lungi, um, was made there. There's a web production company in Little Holton. Um, they uh, have made, for example, New Street Law, though that only got one series. And there is a new, obviously, a new phase of local television stations, and we don't know where they'll go. Will Channel M be subsumed in that? And that's where I just come back to a final reference to The Guardian and Salford, because The Guardian Media Group owns Smooth FM, which is at Salford Keys. So not Media City, but not far away. And it's kind of ironic, or perhaps not surprising, that The Guardian seems to have gone cold on Channel M, given that C.P. Scott said, television, the word is half Latin and half Greek. No good can come of it. <laughs> so basically, my conclusions are mass media hubs. The hub analogy originates in the role of transport networks, particularly public ones in communication. It was never meaningful in return in relation to radio and television, and it's less meaningful now in terms of newspapers. I say call them clusters. Manchester is a mass media centre. 90 years, undoubtedly, a major mass media pub. And it has been a scene of, of mass media innovation, you know, line cast technology and radio being too, but also bring a distinctive voice to the mass media. And this is at the heart of what the BBC say that the move of many production facilities to solve is about, about bringing in kind of regional viewpoints. So that should have stand Manchester in good stead, that long track record. And finally, in terms of the physical character, heritage of the mass media, with rare exceptions, mass media industries haven't yielded truly distinctive buildings. And I think that's why there's an apathy amongst industrial archaeologists and architectural historians. But the machinery of the mass media, you know, general sense of you know, the equipment that's used for production, for distribution, and for consumption, is very worthy of study alongside the media outputs and the other documentary sources, as I hope I've illustrated. <laughs>